Okay, we're live. All right, this next section is going to be on uh, joining. I don't think this will be as long as the uh, section we just did. Now, first, first rule we're going to talk about is rule 18A. It's a pilot or on roll. Back. Let's see if I can pull up some of the blocks we're pleading right here. We're joining her right here. There you go. 18A, pile it on. What 18A tells us is that once you have a proper claim, counterclaim, third party claim, or cross claim, you can pile on additional claims, even if they're unrelated. Now, I'll get back to that. Let's start talking about the various techniques by which we add on additional parties or additional claims. Rule 13. Uh, counterclaims, 13A and B. Regarding counterclaims, you have two kinds, compulsory and, uh, and uh, permissive. Now, people often say compulsory means same T or O, but it's more complex than that. For something to be a compulsory counterclaim under 13A, all right, then the claim and counterclaim have to rise with the same transaction or occurrence. The counterclaim has to be right. The counterclaim must not require adding any additional parties over whom the court would lack jurisdiction. So it can't be a jurisdictional problem. And it's got to be something that's not pending in another suit. And finally, a counterclaim is not compulsory if the basis for jurisdiction over the defendant was attachment. Okay? Some sort of personal, some sort of jurisdiction that's not in persona. And I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to test on that, but I'm just going to remind you of that. You know, attachment scenarios. All right? 13B, permissive counterclaims, is very strangely defined. It means anything not compulsory. And it's actually a very elegant um, definition. Because people will say, oh, if it's TRO, say P60 for negligence, and then it's better once a counterclaim for negligence for the same act, the same car accident, right? Well, you know, compulsory counterclaim. But the problem with that is, is sometimes you have counterclaims that arise from the same transaction of occurrence, which aren't compulsory. So say, for example, B versus A in state court for negligence from a car wreck, all right? And that's a state court. And now in federal court, A versus B for negligence for the same car wreck, right? And the question becomes, must B assert a counterclaim against A um, in federal court? The answer is no. The counterclaim, if any, would be from the same transaction or occurrence, right? The same car wreck. That's satisfied. And it's right. Right means the claim, counterclaim is available to the defendant at that time, right? So the counterclaim is right. Let's assume there's no jurisdictional problems. However, the claim of B versus A is already pending in the state court. That means that B's counterclaim against A, this suit, uh, would be permissive rather than a compulsory. Remember, permissive means anything not compulsory. So even though this counterclaim is the same TRO, um, it's still a permissive counterclaim because it's already pending in the state litigation, leaving to be the option of whether or not to pursue it as a counterclaim in um, federal court. Now, by the way, just to kind of review ahead, to teach ahead, Suppose B does assert the counterclaim against A in federal court. That's, of course, a 13B counterclaim, right? Let's say that this lawsuit goes to judgment first, right? Let's say B loses, all right? Well, guess what? If this case goes to a final judgment first, then the judgment here on B's claim against A becomes res judicata, right? And now, in suit number two, A will assert claim preclusion 
against D on B's power claim, and it's gone, right? Isn't that elegant? <coughs> Pretty cool. All right. Now, T or O, the book and a lot of other study resources give a lot of really unhelpful guidance, all right, regarding T or O. For example, one of the words, it has to do more with torts than the other, right? The book tells you about using the logical relationship test, you know, whether it's substantially the same evidence would be used for both claims, right? Whether or not principles of res judicata would bar uh, both claim or counterclaim, you know, whether res judicata would be relevant, okay? All of those are, are, are helpful and somewhat unhelpful, right? Because for instance, here we're looking at tra transaction or occurrence, and then the book tells us, well, this is like analyzing res judicata. But we know under the restatement, the transactional approach for res judicata is a transactional approach, which is kind of like this, right? So that's not real helpful. So instead, when you're analyzing in my essay or my exam, things like transaction, occurrence, conduct transaction, occurrence, series of transactions or occurrences, uh, things like that, think about a couple of things. First, what function does that language play in a particular role? For example, the CTO language in Rule 15C1C. All right. We're concerned about the same conduct or transaction in C1B and C1C because we want to be fair to the defendant that's being dragged in, or to the defendant who's having a claim being asserted against them, right? So it, it is kind of work with the policy there is notice, all right? But under other rules like uh, Rule 13 um, A counterclaims, uh, we're concerned about what makes for a convenient and efficient and economical trial package, right? If the claim and counterclaim are sufficiently closely related in terms of evidence, in terms of um, facts, in terms of time, then that makes the claim and the counterclaim more efficiently tried together. And we have cases in the book where the uh, uh, counterclaim rule has been broadly applied, uh, or, or rather in a Rule 20, rather. I'm thinking of Rule 20. Rule 20 like Rule 13, is concerned with what makes for a convenient trial package, right? Rule 13A asks about same transaction or occurrence. Uh, Rule 20A about permissive joinder of multiple plaintiffs or multiple defendants is asking about whether it's the same transaction, occurrence, or series of transactions or occurrences. But it's the same concern there, right? What makes for a convenient trial package? And there I want you to go back and look at the cases in the book and see that in some cases, Hero has been construed pretty broadly. And the reason being is this, this idea of efficient, convenient, and economical trial package. Okay? So, you know, TRO or the variants of that, that term simply just aren't rules. Um, they're the essence of standardish language that gives courts a lot of discretion to apply to varying fact patterns. All right, so that's 13A and 13B, counterclaims. We also have cross-claims under Rule 13G, cross-claims. Now, cross-claims are for claims between co-parties. So you have A sues B and C, say for negligence, three-car accident. All right, three-car accident, A, B, and C, a sues B and C for negligence. Can B sue C for the sale of the stamp collection? No. No or yes? Yes. Next or yo? No. No. The answer would be no, no. That's right. All right. That's not going to be possible because B versus C is not the same TRO. Now, B versus C is not a counterclaim, it's a cross claim. Cross claims are uh, by one third party um, against another. How about this one? B versus C for negligence from that same car accident. Is that a proper cross claim? Yeah. It is. Must B assert this cross claim no. against C? No. no. The answer is no. May assert. And this is another reminder people like to say TRO means compulsory. No, it doesn't. TRO is one of the elements of a compulsory counterclaim under 13A. In contrast, under 13G, 
we need that transactional relationship between an original claim or an original counterclaim, and they must be related, one or the other must be related to the cross claim. All right? But cross claims are never compulsory. All right? They're never compulsory. What does that mean? That means B can sue C in this lawsuit, or B can choose not to sue C in this lawsuit. Now, B could assert a number of cross claims here. B could assert a cross claim against C for negligence, for B's damages. That would be okay under Rule 13J, so long as the cross claim arises from the same transaction occurrence of A versus B or A versus C. All right. Additionally, under Rule 13G, B could seek a contribution. That's also a proper cross claim under Rule 13G. Here, B would be saying to C, hey, C, to the extent B, I owe anything to A, you owe that to me. Now, we have B asserting these two 13G cross claims, one for B's damages and another one for contribution from C. And I'll just continue with the chalkboard here. Now, can B sue C for the stamp collection? Yes, and that's because of Rule 18A. Pile it on. Pile it on. Once we have at least one proper claim, counterclaim, cross claim, third party claim, and the like, the claimant may now assert any additional claims um, they have against the uh, opposing party. Now, that doesn't mean that the court's going to hear all these claims together. But don't forget that under Rule 21, the court can sever a lawsuit into two separate lawsuits. Or under Rule 42, the court can keep the lawsuit as one lawsuit, then order separate trial on one more claims or one more party, so on and so forth. So let's assume the court doesn't sever, but nonetheless it orders a separate trial on the stamps because it's just going to confuse the jury. Bless you. Now, another thing that people can do under the <coughs> Georgia rules is add on additional parties, all right? So say, for example, A sues B for a car wreck. Let's assume that B counterclaims against A for that same car wreck, compulsory counterclaim under 13A. B can also join C as an additional party. Now, the reason B can join C as an additional party on the counterclaim is because of two rules. Uh, the first one is Rule 13H, which says that a party asserting a cross-claim or a counterclaim can add additional parties to that cross-claim or counterclaim to the extent otherwise permitted under Rules 19 or 20. Well, so long as the joiner of A and C as co-defendants is permitted by Rule 20, then 13H would permit this to be done as well. And you can do the same thing on counterclaims, cross-claims, and, um, and the like. Now let's talk about Rules 20 and 19. Rule 20 and Rule 19 are about joiner of additional parties. Rule 20 is permissive. And Rule 19 is required. Water. And the standard for Rule 20 is really broad. Rule 20 allows joiner of multiple plaintiffs or defendants so long as it's the same transaction, occurrence, or series of transactions of occurrences, and you have at least at least one common question of fact or law. Now, most fact patterns, this is going to be easily met. The harder question is going to be this one, the same transaction, occurrence, or series thereof. That's the case we have in the book. We tend to focus on this issue right here. All right. We also know from Rule 20 that Rule 20 permits joiner of multiple plaintiffs versus one defendant. 
or one plaintiff versus multiple defendants, or both. All right. Now, question. What happens if we have a fact pattern, we have multiple plaintiffs or multiple defendants, but they're not properly joined? Say, for instance, we have this scenario, like the ones in the book, right? A, B, and C all sue D for employment discrimination, like the case in the book, right? Well, if they're properly joined, then the case remains in court. The court can still order separate trials, but it doesn't have to. It's in the court's discretion. But what if joiner is improper? Say, for example, the claims don't arise from the same transaction occurrence or series of transactions or occurrences. Well, this is what we would call misjoinder. Misjoinder is when you join multiple parties or multiple claims, even though the rules do not permit you to do so. The question, what is the remedy for misjoinder? The remedy for Ms. Joyner is not dismissal of the entire case. Instead, Rule 21 tells us Ms. Joyner parties is not a ground for dismissing an action. Instead, the court can add a drop of party or may sever a claim against any party. So here what the court could do is add or drop one or more parties, but we'd still have to keep a civil action. Or the better thing to do here would be sever these claims into one, two, three, separate civil actions, each of one well, which will have its own docket number and each of which will proceed separately. Now, you'll note that I just talked about misjoinder. Now we need to make a distinction between misjoinder and non-joinder. All right? Misjoinder is when you've joined improperly. Like I just said, the remedy is not dismissing the entire civil action. Non-joiner, that's Rule 19, guys. Non-joiner is when Rule 19 is violated. All right? Rule 19 tells us that some parties are required for just adjudication. And if they're required for just adjudication, the court must join if joiner is feasible. <clears throat> All right. Now the rule itself <laughs> goes into a number of scenarios where joiner is required. So for example, P sues D P sues D saying D needs to repair the wiring inside an office building. And D says, I can't give you the relief you want because I, myself, the defendant, am just a tenant and I'm not the actual owner of the property and the only person permitted to repair the property is the actual owner of the building. So for just adjudication, we need to, and full relief, we need to join in the owner of the building as well, okay? Other situations I gave examples for in class were when you had an escrow, right? A buyer and seller, buyer gives a hand money to the escrow agent, and then the deal falls through, and now buyer and seller are both claiming that they want the money from the escrow agent, right? Buyer sues the escrow agent, and the escrow agent says the seller is needed for just education. Scenarios like that, all right? When a person is required to be joined, then the court must join them if joiner is feasible. But sometimes joiner is not going to be feasible. For example, joining the absent person might destroy subject matter jurisdiction. For example, the absent person is not diverse from the plaintiff. For example, the court might lack personal jurisdiction over the absent person and not be able to join them without their consent. For example, the court will lack venue over the person to be joined and can join them. Uh, there's other examples in the law, such as sovereign immunity and the like, but I won't get into it. The basic gist here is there's this person that needs to be joined. I call them the VIP, right? The very important person. 
and you have to join them if feasible. So in other words, you have to invite them to the lawsuit, right, to the party. Well, this is the essence of Rule 19 of A. Required to join the VIP, and you must join them if the order is feasible. Well, the problem comes up, what if there's this VIP that must be joined, the joiner is not feasible because, for example, we destroy diversity jurisdiction. Well, then you get to the third part of the analysis, which is 19B, which is to proceed or dismiss. In other words, I call this cancel the party. All right. 19B is an equitable decision to be made by the court. There's somebody that should have been joined, but they can't then be joined. It would destroy subject matter jurisdiction. Well, do we proceed with the existing parties, or we do we dismiss the entire civil action? Right. Now, this to remind ourselves, this is the essence of non-joiner. If here, I'm about to draw the arrows there. If this party should have been joined, but they weren't. That's not this joiner, that's non joiner. Somebody should have been joined if they're not. Well, the court will go through this analysis. And the ultimate remedy for non joiner is possibly to dismiss the entire civil action. Because this absent person is so important for just adjudication that we just can't proceed without this absent person. So, again, the contrast between this joiner and non joiner. This joiner is you can drop a party or sever, but you can't dismiss the entire case. For a non-joiner, a possible remedy is to dismiss the entire civil action, the whole kit caboodle. All right. Now, when we get down to this 19B scenario, uh, the, court, the rule gives us four non-exclusive factors for the court to look at. Looking at things, the prejudice, the existing parties, and the absent persons, the ability to shape the remedy, um, and, because of the person who's absent, uh, the existence of an alternative forum, and things like that. All right? And if you have a story like that, then just go through these steps. Required? Yes or no? Can you join them? Yes or no? Required? You can't join them? You go down the 19 B factors. I give you the, the rule handout, go through the factors. All right? And also, for, don't forget, on the website, am I wrong? I believe there's a handout on the website. Am I right? Okay, so there's the Rule 19 flow chart, which goes through it real um, methodically. All right, let's move on. Almost done with Joiner. I think what we have, uh, uh, Rule 14, we have Interpleader, and we have Class Actions. And that's it for Joiner. Oh, let's set this up.
contribution. So what if I told you that this was actually a three-car accident? Let's, let's add some facts. This is a three-car accident. The defendant says, hey, Bob, you're one of the people who contributed to the injury. So to the extent that I'm liable to this guy, you need to contribute to me. So say, for example, the jury ultimately holds that, that D is liable to plaintiff for $100,000, right? And let's say under the relevant uh, rules of contribution that each tort feeser has to contribute half of the cost. If there's two, <laughs> like say for, for however many tort feasers are, we divide the judgment by the number of tort feasers, right? So two tort feasers means that Bob owes 50% to David, which to me, $50,000, you see? So now the end result would be plaintiff gets his $100,000 from David, and then the defendant gets $50,000 um, from Bob. And that seems fair, right? Because then now the defendant is not stuck the entire tab um, for um, the liability. Well, that would be an appropriate form of third party practice. I'll make a recommendation to you. Um, in, in your exam, just avoid using the word uh, M pleader because people get confused between M pleader and inter pleader. So for this Rule 14 stuff, call it third party practice. Much simpler, much more descriptive of what's going on, right? And indeed, what do we call this person? Third party what? Third party plaintiff, third party defendant. Now we know that once we have a proper third party claim here, so say there's a claim here for contribution, now the defendant can assert a claim for stamps, right? Against Bob, pile it on rule, right? Once you have the proper third party claim, you can pile it on. Now I'm going to remove this one and just point out some other things. The plaintiff could sue Bob, right? So long as plaintiff's claim against Bob arises from the same TRO as plaintiff versus David, or plaintiff versus defendant, right? That's fine. Equally so, Bob could assert a claim against plaintiff, so long as it's the same TRO as P versus D. In fact, if Bob sues P, then we have to ask whether plaintiff has a compulsory counterclaim against Bob. And equally so, I did tell you this was a three-car wreck, right? So if Bob has a compulsory counterclaim against David, Bob versus David, then Bob's got to assert that um, as well, right? And it, it, it can get more complicated than that, right? So for example, D versus B, all right, for contribution. And then Bob is all PO'd because Bob, Bob's thinking to the extent that he's at fault in part for the accident, he's a contributing port user. It's because of the mechanic that screwed his car up. So got plaintiff, third party plaintiff, third party defendant. Now Bob is the fourth party plaintiff. And this is the fourth party defendant. I call this the viral rule, right? And the argument here is Bob is saying mechanic. To the extent that I owe contribution to the defendant, you owe Mr. Mechanic to me. And then D is saying, Bob, he said, I owe to P, you owe to me. Now what if P, excuse me, what if D asserts a counterclaim, right, for negligence? And the plaintiff says, oh, I owe contribution by the tire manufacturer, right? Because this is a contributing tort feeser, okay? Well, a plaintiff can assert a third party claim if the plaintiff is the subject of a counterclaim, right? Now, as you can see, these can get very complicated, right? What I'll say, what I'll remind us of is regardless of com com complications, we must always remember that joinder and subject matter are two separate considerations. Even if the joinder rules are satisfied, we still have to analyze subject matter jurisdiction if that's the issue that's raised, right? One place where subject matter and joinder become very closely intertwined is supplemental order jurisdiction, right? Because under 1367B, we have to ask whether the lawsuit falls within one of the 
um, listed joiner scenarios, but we'll get to that in a bit. All right, that's rule 14. What does that leave? Interpleader and class actions. Interpleader, here's a pen. I found it. Two of you say it's yours. All right, what I can do is I can go ahead and sue you two and make you interplead amongst each other to figure out which one of you gets the pen. The pen is called, what do we call the pen? The what? The state, that's correct. In interpleader, we have the state, which is the property. We have the stakeholder, that's me, because I brought the pen. And we have the claimants. All right, now Nathanson could file an interpleader action against A, A, and B, saying, hey, both A and B are saying that they are the ones proper owners of this golden state, let the court figure it out, right? So that's one way to do interpleader. Another way to do interpleader is say A versus N, right? A sues Nathanson saying, yo, you converted my, my golden pen, I want you to give it back to me. Well, guess what Nathanson can do by way of counterclaim? Interpleader. Because Nathanson's concerned that if he gives the pen to A, that he's going to face B in a separate suit, and Nathanson's going to face inconsistent or duplicative liability. So by counterclaim, he can assert an interpleader counterclaim. Well, we have two flavors of interpleader. <coughs> one is rule-based, and the other one is uh, statutory. Section of 1335 of the Judicial Code. And uh, I've got so many uh, handouts on the website. Please correct me. Do I have a handout on the website regarding uh, interpleader? Yeah, that, that shows the various types and the various permutations. Is that correct, actually? Yeah, I thought I did. Wait, wait, wait. Yes, I have so many things on my own website, I don't even know what I have on my website anymore. What? There we go. Yeah. There we go. There we go. So you go on the website. Civil procedure, then resources, and then joinder, and then interpleader. All right, looking at the handout, subject matter jurisdiction for rule based interpleader is all the normal stuff. In fact, for rule based, based interpleader, it's just a normal SMJ PJ analysis. Okay, normal SMJ typically going to be diversity, normal rules of PJ, which we talked about last semester, normal rules of venue, and so on. For statutory interpleader, that's the superpowered kind, all right? Whereas normal diversity requires an amount of controversy exceeding $75,000, not counting interest or costs, and requires complete diversity, statutory interpleader requires an amount of controversy of only 500 or more, much, much cheaper, and also requires only minimal diversity. I'm not going to talk about it beyond that because that's all in the, uh, the videos from the fall, and we discussed that in the fall review. PJ, also much more powerful. It permits nationwide services process so long as all of the claimants are served within a judicial district. There's going to be PJ over them. Very, very powerful. And there's also a special rule of venue. And again, I'm not going to get into that. Already been there, done that. We discussed that last semester. All right, what does that leave? Uh, Rules 23 and 24, let's talk about them in reverse. Rule 24, I didn't spend a lot of time on. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that now. That's the inter intervener, that's the uh, party crasher rule. That's somebody who wasn't sued, um, but they decide to crash the party anyway. They want to be a litigant. This might come up in like public interest litigation, for example. There's an environmental case and some public interest groups 
um, we want to interview this party so they, they can actually uh, have a right to leave court. All right. 24A is intervention um, as of right. Rule 24B is intervention um, by uh, permission of the court. Here I'm just going to refer you to the rules themselves. You'll note that the language Rule 24A is very similar to some of the language from Rule 19A. There we go. One basis is the federal statute gives an unconditional right to intervene. Another one is claiming an interest related to the property or transaction that's the subject of the action and is so situated that disposing of the action may as a practical matter of error be the movement's ability to protect its interest unless existing parties adequately represent that interest. Any questions? <laughs> Permissive intervention is a lot easier, but it's up to the court. Um, either a traditional <coughs> right to intervene or a claim or defense that shares with the main action a total question of fact um, or law. So that's pretty broad. You know, even broader than the uh, standard for a permissive joinder under Rule 20A. All right, let's turn to class actions and we'll finish out joinder and then move on to other stuff. Uh, Rule 23, we spent just one day on and I'm not going to spend much time on it uh, today. All right, Rule 23A now covers the preconditions of commonality, numerosity, typicality, uh, adequate representation. This is Rule 23A. All four of these have to be satisfied um, that by themselves these are not sufficient for a class action to be certified. Uh, commonality means you have to have one or more questions of law or fact between all class members. Numerosity means that it's a sufficiently large number of uh, people that it makes sense to use the class action device. Uh, typicality means that the claims of the representatives are typical of the class members. And adequate representation means that the uh, class representatives will uh, adequately represent the interests of the class members. Remember, class action, the actual litigants are going to be uh, the class representatives. So say, for example, um, Sydney is a class representative on behalf of a class of people, all right? She is the litigant, and she is representing the interests of all the people in that class. And who's in the class is going to depend on how the class is defined and the uh, complaint and ultimately in the certification order. Uh, the members really don't litigate, though with some types of class actions, they're giving notice and an opportunity to opt out or to object to the fairness of the settlement at a, a fairness hearing. Well, let's assume we've satisfied the Rule 23A prerequisites. Then we have to move to Rule 23B, which are the types of class actions um, here Refer to the rule uh, 23B1A and B1B are what are often known as mandatory class <coughs> actions. These are much more limited. The more common types of class action would be a 23B2 and a 23B3. 23B2 is generally speaking one seeking of uh, injunctive or declaratory relief, uh, such as a declaration that a, a, uh, a, a school district is violating uh, students' rights through a certain policy, right? Seeking some sort of declaration and inductive relief. 23B3 is the one that's typically used in a product's liability or a toxic tort or uh, some sort of consumer fraud action. Um, an action where you're seeking uh, monetary relief as a core type of relief. Uh, 23B3 is harder to get certified than the other types under Rule 23B. Because for Rule 23B, you have to show superiority and what was it? Ah, oh, predominance. So for a 23B3 class action, the class representatives have to convince the court that a class action is superior to other forms of joiner and that the common questions will predominate over individual questions. Think, for example, say like an asbestos case, right? An asbestos case 
where one brand of asbestos is alleged to have caused injuries to uh, thousands and thousands of workers, but each of those workers will have different diseases at different times, different severities in different places. And it may be that individual issues of causation and damages may be so different that they predominate over the common issues. And under 23b3, we ask, we don't want the individual issues to predominate, we want the common issues to predominate. All right, what else about class actions? Uh, the court's gotta certify the class action. Uh, the court is the one that gets to select who the class lawyer is going to be. Uh, if there's a settlement, uh, the court has to approve it. Uh, what else will I tell you? With the 23B3 class action, the 23B3 class action, not only are those additional hoops of predominance and superiority required, but also the court has to give a notice, a very broad notice, and the right to class members to opt out. All right, that's all I have to say on class actions. And I believe that's all I have to say on Twitter.